So hi, my name is Ruba and I am a PhD student at University College London in the UK. So today I'm going to talk about the obstacles that hinder users' adoption of secure communication tools. And I would like to actually thank all my co-authors for their contributions to this work. So, as we know that security experts have been advocating the use of secure communication tools to counter mass surveillance. Some tools have added security features. Uh, for example, WhatsApp has famously deployed end-to-end -end encryption. Other tools have, have been launched with security as a key selling point, such as Telegram and Signal. However, it really remains unclear if users understand what protection these tools offer and if they value this protection. Usable security has always been considered a key challenge for secure communications. And there have been basically two ways to approach this usable security problem. One approach has been designing and conducting user studies to examine why users fail to use existing secure, sec secure communication tools. Uh, such as PGP, often concluding that security failures arise due to user interface design flaws. The other approach has been producing educational materials to explain existing security tools and extensions. And these materials are actually guidelines that provide step-by-step -step instructions to download and use these applications in a correct and secure way. However, we all know that documentation is only helpful if users read it and if users are motiva motivated enough to use a new application. So we argue that in order to design and build communication tools that effectively protect users, we need to understand how users define or perceive secure communications and what influences their decision to adopt or stop using a particular communication tool. In this endeavor, um, our work explores why, when, and how users use secure communication, what threats they want to protect against when communicating with different parties, what communication tools users perceive to be secure and in, or insecure and why, and how users think secure communications can be achieved and how they can be violated. So we designed a user study and we recruited 60 participants by posting flyers around UCL's buildings in the UK and emailing staff members. With 60 participants, we interviewed 23 male and 35 female participants. Two, uh, two participants preferred not to indicate their gender and our participants' ages ranged between, uh, from 18 to 70 with a mean age of 31. Two participants didn't have an, edu an educational qualification, seven completed their high school education, 30 had a college degree, and 21 had a higher degree, such as an MSc or a PhD. Uh, we actually then started by conducting 10 unstructured interviews that lasted for 35 minutes on average. The emerging themes helped design the script for the 50 semi-structured interviews that lasted for 90 minutes on average each. Uh, now I will explain the procedure of the semi-structured interview sessions. All semi-structured interview sessions uh, cover the following four areas in the same order in order to avoid bias. First, for every communication tool that has been used by our participants, we were interested in why they decided to adopt that specific tool the computer platforms that the tool runs on, with whom they communicate using that tool, what kind of information they exchange using the tool, what the context of use is, how they define sensitive information, whether they have sens sensitive information using that particular tool, and finally, why, why they decided to stop using the application if they have it. Second, uh, we know that many communication tools are nowadays are being advertised as being secure or, or encrypted. But securing a system is really meaningless without defining a security policy and a threat model. So we wanted to investigate the link between um, the actual security offered by different secure communication tools and how users define secure communications. So we asked our participants about the kind of protection a secure communication tool should provide, 
uh, the assets that they want to protect when communicating with others, and who the adversaries might be and what their capabilities and resources are. Third, uh, based on their definition of security in the second part, we asked our participants to rank the communication tools they have been using in terms of the security level that uh, each application offers. Um, so we actually gave them some cards with the names and logos of the applications they have been using and asked them to sort the applications from the most to the least secure. And we also wanted to assess the effectiveness of the Electronic Frontier Foundation or the EFF Secure Messaging Scorecard. So the EFF in 2014 released um, a scorecard that basically provides objective information to non-security specialists about the security properties that different communication tools actually offer. Uh, so the scorecard evaluates different applications uh, on the basis of whether the application is encrypted in transit or end-to-end -end encrypted, whether it has a verification fingerprint, whether it supports forward secrecy for the communications, whether its security design is properly uh, documented, whether it's open source, and whether the code has been recently audited. So we wanted to, to, to assess the effectiveness of the scorecard in communicating which application is secure and why. So we asked our participants to compare their rankings with those on the scorecard, and we gave them some time to explore the scorecard. And finally, uh, we wanted to test our participants' broader understanding of how a security property can be achieved and, at, and how it can be breached. Uh, we also asked our participants about specific mechanisms such as encryption, digital signatures, and verification fingerprints. So we were actually interested in seeing whether our participants can associate different mechanisms with different properties, such as associating encryption with uh, confidentiality and so forth. Um, a single researcher conducted all the 60 interviews. A transcription-based service transcribed all the interview sessions word by word. Three researchers independently coded the transcripts, and we all met to, uh, to, to develop the final code book. And after that, we calculated the intercoder uh, coder agreement. Um, the average Cohen's Kappa coefficient for all the themes in the paper was 0 0.83, and a value uh, above 0 0.75 is considered excellent agreement. And finally, we analyzed the code book to develop main themes. I will now present some of the key results in our paper. And I want to say that our research is qualitative. And the main purpose of qualitative research is to explore a phenomenon in depth and not to generate quantitative results. So we didn't do any, quantit any quantitative analysis. So we found that usability is not the primary obstacle to adoption. Um, our participants reported some usability issues with the tools they have been using, but they actually didn't stop using the applications because of those usability issues. Fragmented and small user bases are a significant obstacle. So the common current trend uh, nowadays of creating new secure communication tools and then assessing the usability of these applications is somehow an obstacle because this trend creates small and fragmented user bases in a way that uh, users can't reach all their communication partners using one or two applications. Lack of interoperability is another significant obstacle. For example, iMessage and FaceTime are applications that work with iOS slash Apple devices, but um, although these applications have been perceived as secure by most of our participants, they weren't uh, used because um, they can't work across different devices and our participants prefer to use other applications that work with different uh, or across different platforms even if those applications were perceived as less, less secure. Lack of utility fosters insecure behavior. So our participants chose specific tools based on the services the tools offer. That means that if an application doesn't support sending large volumes of data, uh, such as files or media messages, uh, users will not use the application even if it was secure. Um, another example could be Telegram. Telegram is an application that supports two chat modes, the default chat mode and the more secure secret chat mode. 
but the more secure secret chat mode doesn't support group conversations, making all the participants in our studies in our study uh, used the less secure default chat mode because it supports group chats. Um, low quality of service is an obstacle to adoption. Almost 90% of, of our participants assess the reliability and security of an application based on the quality of service of the voice calls and messages they experience. So if an application has a bad audio quality, that means that the application is really insecure. So low quality of service doesn't only hinder adoption, but also it creates general doubts about how secure and reliable the application is. Uh, perceived sensitivity of information should drive adoption, but that wasn't the case with our participants. So our participants prefer to share sensitive information in person, and if that wasn't possible, they would do that using phone calls or video conferences. And they actually, like almost 95% of the participants, perceived calls as more secure than text messages for a wide range um, of reasons or, or rather misconceptions. So for example, they said that phone calls are, require a lot of time and effort to analyze and process. So a human being is needed to listen to every phone call and then try to extract the sensitive information, whereas in text messages, uh, text messages can actually be searched for keywords by developing an algorithm or a code. And that was a misconception shared by many participants. Um, also, some participants preferred to use obfuscation techniques. So they would develop their own encryption scheme, mainly a substitution cipher, and share the cipher with trusted participants before sharing any sensitive information. Uh, Almost all participants perceive secure communications as futile. They said that secure tools cannot protect against knowledgeable and powerful adversaries. And this is because if you have an application provider, it means that the provider knows how an encryption scheme works. So it knows how to reverse engineer the scheme, regardless of or no matter how strong the scheme is. And that was a misconception. Uh, when we asked our participants to rank the communication tools they have been using in terms of how secure they are, none of the rankings were inaccurate. And more interestingly, most participants ranked the services offered by the tools rather than ranking the tools themselves. So we gave them some time to rank the services, and after that, we asked them to rank the tools themselves. And when they did so, they based their, their rankings on how large the tool's user base is, uh, the quality of the service and other social factors. However, they didn't think about assessing the security features an application offers. And finally, participants didn't understand the Electronic Frontier Foundation scorecard. So the scorecard, as I said, it has seven different security properties. And uh, our participants weren't able to distinguish between end-to-end -end encryption and point-to-point -point encryption. They also didn't comprehend forward secrecy or appreciate verification fingerprints. And all the, the three security properties that has to do with open design were perceived as negative uh, properties with participants believing that security requires obscurity. obscurity. So I want to conclude with the following recommendations. I think that as security experts, we need to define what utility is for secure communication tools. And utility in this context meaning that enabling users to reach all their communication, or at least most of their communication partners, using a communication tool. After defining utility, we need to support it. And we can support it by securing tools with improved utility. So rather than building new secure communication tools and then assessing the usability of these tools, we could actually try working on secure applications that have already been adopted by mainstream users. And third, um, I would say that um, security is something that's very difficult to evaluate for users. So they always look for proxy signals. So that means that we can spend some of our engineering effort on improving the performance of different cryptographic tools to the extent that latency and dropped packets can be reduced. Fourth, we can fix usability issues by thinking and creating UI, better UI designs. 
And finally, we can uh, organize some public information campaigns in a way that we address users' misconceptions, such as teaching them that encryption is, or can, is effective and can protect against different kinds of adversaries. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for, for hello. Thank you for this very interesting talk. We have time for some questions, but I'd like to start by asking one question. So uh, I thought it was very interesting that you found that uh, users did not perceive these secure tools as useful against powerful adversaries. Yes. Uh, so in some sense, this goes back to, to the first talk by, by Cormac, which was about how do researchers trust claims of security? This is about how users trust uh, claims of security, right? So my question is, how do you, what are your thoughts uh, about how we can uh, make this happen without requiring users to actually learn, you know, security so in general? We don't need to make users learn security, but I think we need to somehow teach them that secure communications can protect against powerful adversaries. All right, we have to do that. All right, so uh, <laughs> next question. Hi, thanks for your talk. My name is Aline, I'm from MIT. Um, I really like your work. I think it's really important that we investigate the usability of these things and why people don't use them. I was wondering if you asked the participants if they ever found themselves censoring themselves because of the lack of security. Like they might not send something over text and they wanna use a secure messaging app and how does that affect um, decisions. So do you mean like anonymous communications? Like they wanted to somehow be anonymous? No, like for instance, I might not say certain things over the mobile phone because I know it's not secure. Do, did you ever ask your users if they made such decisions? Uh, well, most of our participants would prefer to do that in person, face to face. But if they had to send some kind of, well, that depends on the sensitivity of info. So if they want to send banking details, they would do that over the phone because they believe that no one's really interested in their banking account details. But if they were discussing political issues, they will never do that over the phone. So it depends on, how, on the type of the information they're sending. Does that answer your question? Hi, John Criswell, University of Rochester. Good work. Um, one question that I have is when, you, when users were asked about strong adversaries, um, how did they interpret that? So what to them was a strong adversary? Um, a government agency or the service provider, or even sometimes um, science, computer scientists. So if, an <laughs> yeah. so if an adversary knows how an application works, um, they somehow know how encryption works, and if they know how the encryption scheme works, they know how to re reverse engineer it. So they think that if you have a computer science degree, you know how to reverse engineer encryption schemes. <laughs> thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker once more.